So Jeff, you've been quoted as saying that IBM is focusing on operationalizing culture. Can you say a little bit about what that means to operationalize culture and why it's important? I think uh, why it's important is probably the, the, the first piece, which uh, is it's really the only unique thing any company really has. Anything else can be copied, your products and your strategies. So the idea is, is there a way um, to create a great culture and make it something that you can learn, that you can practice, that you can measure, um, and that you can adapt so that you can continue to get better? So for us, it's finding the mechanisms and, and defining culture in a way so it's tangible for employees so we can raise the water level of talent and ultimately the tactics and the methods they can do so we can compete against the best tech companies. Mm -hmm. and and how are the, um, you know, how, how is culture changing? You know, what, what does it mean to operational, operationalize culture today as opposed to, say, 10 years ago? Yeah, I think, think the thing that we've, we looked at is, you know, we, we want to have the innovation of the best small tech companies, but, but hopefully the scale of IBM. And we've got 400,000 employees. If you add in contractors, another 130,000. So the question is, you know, how can you, how can you create something with the best practices that are out there. And in our minds, that culture is around creating, you know, loosely coupled, tightly aligned, eight to 10 person squads, essentially a Spotify model, and, and defining a set of practices that people can go and learn. And it's really, it's no different than if you're learning to play the guitar or you're taking a course or you're on a sports team, you have an instruction or a playbook or something that you go and learn, you practice it, you get feedback, uh, and then you get better at it. And, and so for us, we created a curriculum around 30 key agile practices so that we can loosely connect our teams, but have them learn it. Then when uh, they have issues, we have agile coaches to help. And then to measure it, we have maturity assessments where we can look at squads, see how they're doing, look at leaders, see how they're doing, and give them the signals to get better. So I think the, the thing to do is you have to create mechanisms to give feedback to the teams. And in our case, with so many people, I want the connection uh, between individuals uh, in squads to learn from each other and teams to learn from each other. So the connecting the dots happens with the practitioners doing the work and not the leaders in the overhead that are trying to do it. So it's scaling these squads at a much faster in breadth of pace uh, than the overhead. And I think that's when you can really scale innovation. Okay, great. So uh, you mentioned feedback and mm -hmm. getting feedback to the teams as being a really important element of mm -hmm. this. Um, how do you get that kind of feedback to the teams, and what kind of feedback do they need in order to do this kind of coordination? I think this is another, another thing we learned, is that the feedback should be what the teams feel are important so that they can get better. Again, a lot of cases in big companies, you know, we, we have the leaders create lots of metrics and things that help them, but don't necessarily help the teams get better at their job. So we actually enlist, you know, the teams to figure out what is it that'll help you get better. We want to create, uh, you know, continuous delivery squads that are, that are putting new services into production at the same pace as the best tech companies. So the feedback, in, in our case, we, we do maturity assessments. We look and say, we've got roughly 30 key agile practices. Are you in an entry level, a practitioner, um, you know, or an expert? And then we actually publish those so everyone can see them. So I, we've noticed the team dynamics uh, are, are quite good. People don't mind being compared to other teams. They look at it like a league of great teams and find out who's bettering their practice and go and copy it. Whereas it's very different with individuals. No one likes to be told they're worse than someone else. But uh, we, we think that the team dynamic of giving them the signals that help them get better uh, really, really helps uh, uh, advance and get better at a faster rate. So in our case, in addition to looking at maturity of practices, we'll look at throughput. How much can we get through a funnel? We look at velocity, how fast we can get it through. Uh, cycle time in, in work in progress, making sure that we're giving work at the right pace to the teams to maximize their productivity. But the underlying hypothesis is, let's find out from the teams and the individual what helps them get better, give them the signals, give them the coaching support and curriculum uh, so they can learn on their own, invest in their own career, and take seriously um, you know, that you know, they have to know their craft. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned eight to 10 person squads, mm. um, and there are these teams of teams yeah. working together. Um, how do you scale that? How do you make sure that these teams are actually working with these other teams, and how does that coordination happen? 
So one of the things that we do, one, we did a design from the bottom up. I, I've always said, you know, if restructures you know, were a measure of productivity, every big company in America could be growing at 100%. Um, so instead of organizing top down, organize the squads around the work. And then we run a, a modified Spotify model. So we, we have squads that formed into tribe, multiple tribes into a domain. Um, and then what we do is in, we try to put the mechanisms in place and actually a little bit of forcing the issue as well. Most big companies, I have roughly 20,000 people, um, most big companies would have high level functions like enterprise architecture, project management offices, strategy groups. And our philosophy of strategy is for the leaders, not for strategists. Uh, and that you know, enterprise architecture and the decision should be made by the practitioners. So we run a guild and chapter model where you join a guild for the things that, for the craft that you're passionate about and connect to others in different squads to make the decisions. So actually the way we selected Slack was not done at the high level. It was done by practitioners in a guild across IBM that said, this is the tool we want to use. I just back their decision. Um, so I think that's what we're really trying to do is, is really, you have to have enough talent density within your squad so that they get better and, and course correct, but you also need them interested in their craft to connect to others and squads around the world and connecting teams together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with this sort of bottoms up approach, what is the role of leadership and how is that evolving? So I think for, for the leaders, you know, there's, there's a basic thing. One, they need to give clarity of purpose to their teams. That's number one. And the second is create a productive work environment and then get the heck out of the way. Um, so the signals that we give our leaders are the things that we feel are the most important for them to help create productive squads. So we, uh, we measure the maturity of our leaders on where's the evidence they know how to form eight to 10 person cross-functional teams that are loosely coupled but tightly aligned to our agile practices, how well they manage the flow of work into their squads, are they measuring the right things, you know, the velocity and throughput metrics, are they attracting and replenishing new talent in their squads? Are, are they listening and learning from others? Which I think is the single hardest thing to do. We're very good at listening to ourselves. We're not good at going outside, taking something that someone else has done, pulling it back in and embedding it in the way we work, and then having good influence and impact beyond the scope of service. So those six characteristics, it doesn't matter whether you're a first line leader or an executive, those are all, uh, all critical and, and a priority for us to give the signals to our leaders so that they help their squads get more productive. And I think the issue of leadership is really creating the productive environment and handing the reins over to talented teams and they'll figure out how to solve the problems. We shouldn't be the problem solvers, we should be the environment solvers. Yeah. Um, so transparency hmm. is one of the things that uh, seems to be essential for high levels of collaboration um, across the organization and across boundaries. Um, but protecting information is also really important. Yes. How do you go about balancing the two of those? Well, I think in, in our case, I mean, we would, we would lean on transparency more than, than protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's intellectual property that we need to protect, uh, and, and we can do that you know, through the different you know, vehicles that we have to store and, and share content. Um, but I think the transparency in our case, you know, we publish the maturity results of our squads. And in fact, we have the squads self-assess their own maturity. Mm -hmm. And we will, you know, regulate that through our coaching teams that come in to make sure they're not gaming the system. Um, but we also publish that because we really want to show it's important that you keep score. I mean, and it's, I, I mentioned, you know, playing guitar or playing in sports, you know, you, you want to get something, you want to learn it, you want to practice it individually. You want to practice with your team. You want to get some feedback. And that's, I think, really important to get better. If you want to learn, you not only have to take on something new, you need to practice it and ask for feedback. We give the feedback. We publish it. Give the, give the people, the individuals and teams, um, you know, the signals visibly. And visual control systems work better. We've seen it in manufacturing with lean systems for a long time. Um, and so we really want to give good, simple visual controls uh, and make that available to all the teams so that they can regulate and learn who, and, and find who they can learn from and get better at a faster pace. Great. So um, when operationalizing culture, um, I can see how that could be done when everybody is co-located. Mm. But of course, IBM is highly distributed. Yeah. Um, a lot of people working from home, a lot of people working from around the globe. Mm. So how do you, um, 
operationalize culture, create a common culture when you're so distributed? It, it's hard. Um, and, and, and to be honest, I mean, the greatest learning takes place when you have a big, hairy problem and you get people sitting next to each other to help each other solve it. So I, I think, one, you do need to have some principles. And, and in our case, we had to go back and say, we had teams, you know, a team might have been two people in Boston, two in New York, one in India, three in China. That's not a team, that's just a collection of people. And say, we're going to do as much as we can to consolidate our locations, um, co-locate squads. Not every, not, not that all the squads have to be in the same location, but you'd like them in the same time zone. You want the leaders sitting with their squads. Um, and then you want to give them good collaboration environments that connect to each other. Um, so I think, you know, you have to, you have to understand what, uh, how people learn and create a good environment for them. So for us, it was consolidation uh, of sites. It was getting people, you know, to, you know, to come in and work with their team members to get better and getting leaders in front of their people. Because if a leader's working from home, uh, you know, and is not, you know, regulating an argument between Sally and Bob, they're not exercising their leadership skills either. So for us, it really has been, you know, a shift back toward, you know, get with people, you know, and, and let's get them together in a productive environment so they can learn and, and raise the level of talent and experience, which also raises the ability to take on new tactics and methods that maybe in the initial playbook you weren't gifted enough to do. And, and I think, you know, for us, I think you have to have a good playbook that recognizes the situation you're in. And for us, we have roughly 20,000 people in my team, but IBM with over 500,000 people, uh, you, need, you need, really need to start bottom up. You need to have your principles and your playbook in place so people know where you're going and a simple goal. I mean, ours, I mean, language is important. And for us, we had a simple goal of let's just get the daily delivery. Because I knew if we could solve that, we would have had to solve the tough problems of build automation, test automation, deployment automation, you know, tough, tough technical problems to solve. But I was backing the squads to be able to figure out. Our job was to create the goals, good clarity of purpose, give good tooling so that people could learn and, and get you know, people back congested together uh, so that they could learn from each other at a faster pace. Great. So you mentioned the collaboration environment being really important to culture um, and being able to uh, create this common culture. Um, what is important in the collaboration environment for that? I think one, it has to serve, in our case, it has to serve both individuals connecting to each other, uh, but also teams connecting to each other. And because our, our culture is a, an agile squad culture, and, and what we want, if, you know, and it really is in our principle loosely coupled, we want these squads to be portable, to take on different problems, move them around based on priorities changing, um, and the collaboration environment with our people all over the world has to be able to facilitate uh, communication and learning and feedback. Um, so Slack, uh, you know, was a was a great entry for us for this. And, and quite honestly, we started it as my view is: well, if the practitioners say we need it, let's just open up, see who gets on it. You know, in a couple months, we had 50, 60,000 people using. It. I thought, well, it's got traction. Um, <laughs> so uh, we thought, you know, let's let's move forward with that. But I think it also um, took a lot of the responsibility in our real gifted practitioners to say, gosh, he's serious, he's going to turn it on to us. We better make the right choices and, and usage and consumption is the greatest, greatest indicator of what's working. So we, we would experiment with other things that didn't work either, and if it didn't work, we would just stop it. Um, but the collaboration environment, I think, uh, is, is connecting individuals and connecting teams together so that you know, those squads can connect the dots on solving big problems uh, and get it away from the leaders. And so what we've been able to do is uh, significantly reduce the number of layers of management. I, when I started, we had 13 layers. We're down to five. Uh, and we have a lot fewer leaders, a lot more practitioners. And I'm backing our leaders to say, your job's create a productive environment. Their job's to figure out how to solve the problems and do it. And that has a lot of, uh, it resonates with everyone. Great, so one final question. What's next? Um, you know, what big changes should we anticipate in, in work um, and the future of work in the next five to 10 years? I think we have to have our antennas up for listening to what is actually working. I mean, we, one of our, you know, I mentioned one of, the, one of the six parameters we measure our leaders on is listening and learning and leveraging from others. We give our leaders a lot more credit 
if, if their canvas is a lot wider. So if they're learning externally, pulling that, you know, and externally being other companies outside of IBM, pulling it in, I give them a lot more credit than someone leveraging a practice from someone that's sitting next to them. That's still good, but the greater learning is listening and seeing the signals uh, before they've passed you by. And, and as an example of that, we had uh, some squads that learned a lot from Apple about how to provision Macs over the cloud without an image, and we're the first company to really do that at scale. And I gave them a lot of credit because they went out and you know dropped their ego and arrogance and said, "We're going to go figure this out. Let's learn." And you know the the collective wisdom always outweighs individual insights. So I think our view was, you know, sp you know, get your the windshield's always a lot bigger than the rear view mirror. So don't make your future uh, decisions based uh, future judgments based on your past decisions. So uh, keep a wide canvas. Great. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your interesting insights. Um, and with that, we're going to go to a break. We'll take a 20-minute break. OK, Jennifer, as you know, I just spoke with Jeff Smith from IBM, yeah. who reflected on what's going on in the, the tech industry. Um, and I'm curious to understand your experience um, in the banking industry. Um, so could you, let, let's just start by you talking a little bit about how the banking industry is changing, especially with advances in technology. Sure. So if you think about how um, you interact with your financial institution or bank, um, there's a growing expectation for people to have very real-time interactions, very rich experiences with their bank, and for their bank to be able to anticipate what they need based on what they see of how their customers are using their transactions. Um, and really what we decided was we want to use technology as a competitive differentiator for us. Um, but the only way to really be great at that is to really transform the way we were delivering our innovation and services for our customers um, and, and really reshape ourselves as a technology company. So over the past few years, we've made uh, a big shift towards agile, um, moving away from waterfall, and really lining up our teams in more of a DevOps model so that we can hire thousands of software engineers and really take the ownership of de developing and delivering our own innovation. Um, and really moving to more of a cloud-first um, mentality for how we're doing our software development. So it's been a real transformation for us because we really feel like that's the only way we can deliver those rich experiences for our customers that they are, frankly, expecting these days. Yeah, great. So um, then how do those changes in what you're delivering to the customer affect, that the, way, affect the way that people at Capital One, the employees you've got, um, work, how yeah. work is organized, how information is shared, and so forth. Yeah, in a lot of ways, but I think um, I'd probably pick two of them. Um, one, when you move away from waterfall into Agile, there's a high degree of interactivity and collaboration that Agile teams need in order to be effective. And so what we saw was, um, as we made that shift, having the ability for teams that may not be co-located, that were maybe geographically dispersed, um, to facilitate that level of collaboration and interactivity is really important. And uh, I think Slack's been really helpful to us um, to foster that. And they want to be able to communicate with each other in a way that's genuine and authentic to their team. Um, and so not necessarily using email and other tools, but having that real interaction that makes them feel like there's a culture to their team, a humanity to what they're doing. Um, so I'd say, you know, really the workforce changing for more focused interactivity and intense collaboration. I see the other thing that's not just specific to the way we're doing software development, but just in the workforce in general, um, is as people are more comfortable interacting with technology in their personal and consumer lives, the expectations have risen for what um, we provide to them from an employee capability when they come to work. And I think gone are the days where you could say um, enterprise technology cannot be as modern and, and experience rich as what they're experiencing in their personal lives. So it's really changed the focus for how we deliver our employee experience. And that goes from just the workspace design, like how we actually um, you know, manage our physical workspace, to the tools that we provide our employees so that they can feel that same sense of community and interactivity that they have in their personal lives. But when they come to work, they have an experience that's very similar. Great. So can you say a little bit more about what these changes are in collaboration? So you said there's more interactivity and more intense collaboration, but what does that actually look like? Yeah, so I'd say, you know, like for example, when our Agile teams are getting together, they want to be able to interact with each other over video. They want to be able to pull down the um, artifacts that they're working on and collaborate on them together. Mm -hmm. So it's a real integration of technologies 
um, for people to be able to not only work on something together, but do it in a way where they feel like they're all together in one location. So this intersection of collaboration and, and video and um, you know cap the capabilities to allow them to converse and work as a team are really driving, I think, the integration of tools in the workplace as well. Yeah, great. Um, so you talked a little bit about the expectation uh, right. that, the, that the workers have um, of their workspaces and tools. Um, how do you balance employees' expectations with the needs of the business? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a tough one. I think it's a little bit of an art, um, you know, when we're constantly having this change of technology in the yeah. uh, world and what people are expecting and how we actually, um, you know, make those tools enterprise ready. Um, so we're, we're really looking for um, understanding how people are using technology out in their personal lives and looking for opportunities where we can bring in those technologies and make them enterprise ready and make them um, you know, scale to enterprise use. And I think as we look at tools, we, we pilot and proof of concept them um, and then bring them into the workforce in a way that we can test out how it functions in the enterprise, because oftentimes the enterprise needs are a little bit different than what people are doing in their personal lives. So it's a constant, like, you know, try and learn and see how we can um, you know, make things very successful in the enterprise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you also mentioned um, the importance that it be genuine and authentic. Right. What does that What does that mean? And and can you give me some examples, maybe, of yeah, what that looks and like? Yeah. And I actually, I think, you know, a lot of times when people are doing communications like via email, there's a certain formality that you feel that you need to have when you're writing an email. Um, I think when you use a product like Slack and, p and teams are collaborating in that way, they can just be themselves, right? So if the team is used to talking in, with certain slang or there's a way in which they communicate, I think there's no formality to the tool. Mm -hmm. And so people can actually just be themselves and interact the way they would, just like you and I sitting together in a team and working, right? So mm -hmm. I think um, there's, a, there's a need for it to just be fluid and kind of transparent and seamless to the teams as they're working so that they can kind of get past the formality and get down to the productivity and innovation that we're expecting of them. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, so with regard to technologies that are you know, driving these expectations that your employees have, yeah. what do you see on the forefront? What are you sort of planning for? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we've got, there are a lot of technologies available um, for us in the workplace, but what I see this going towards is um, really having those things work together in a more harmonious way to provide a really rich experience. So I think of the day where I can wake up in the morning and look at my calendar and go to my, you know, workplace app and it will tell me, look, Jennifer, it looks like you're getting a really late start this morning. The parking deck is already full. So you may want to take the metro in. And then when I get there, um, you know, based on what I've already got calendared, it knows that I'm going to need to reserve a desk. And so finding a desk where it's close to uh, where I need to work, me being able to um, converse with technology and say, hey, I'm going to need to meet with someone. Can you please book this room for me in this place? So it's really um, now, I think, maturing. We've we put all these uh, various capabilities in place, but how we actually seamlessly integrate them in a way that the workplace sort of comes alive um, and really supports people throughout their day-to-day -day work in a way that makes them feel like everything's just integrated and it just happens so easily. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of looking forward to the day where we can use the... Um, the information about people, how they're using the tools, um, apply machine learning um, to some of this, and have more advanced analytics to help deliver that experience that we give to our customers, but to our employees. So it's a very rich and um, very, very much integrated experience at work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so some people um, would argue that millennials are different. To what extent um, is what you're talking about really driven by the millennials in the sure. workforce? Um, and to what extent is this just pervasive across yeah, the workforce? I think it's a little bit of both. I think for sure um, our millennial uh, workforce is definitely bringing about some change in thinking for how, what sort of capabilities we have in the workforce. Um, but I also think that as we are um, evolving and deploying these capabilities, they really transcend generation. They are um, really applicable um, to the entire workforce, no matter what generation they're in. I mean, everyone wants to be able to feel like they can collaborate easily, that they can work um, in a genuine way with their teams, that there's some humanity with the way in which they do their work. And so I think the millennial workforce is helping us think differently about what technology we make available, but I think the relevance of it is transcends whatever generation our workforce is in. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I'd like to 
just go back to the, the general idea of you know, these intense collaborations sure. that are happening. Um, can you give me an example of what that actually looks like um, in Capital One? Sure. Um, so I'll pick on um, maybe one of the use cases that we found. Uh, when our teams are uh, triaging an incident, for example, um, you know, they're all together um, you know, working on the same incident, but it may require um, people from different backgrounds to be participating in the resolution of the incident. Mm -hmm. And so that real time, being able to troubleshoot and triage um, where people can say, you know, I've tried this, this actually didn't fix it. Okay, well, let's try this other thing. It's very intense in the moment. I mean, you can imagine in an incident situation, there are times of the essence. And um, that ability to share information and ability to, um, you know, discuss what has been worked on, what hasn't, and really drive forward the um, solution is really important. And that was a use case that we didn't exactly think we were going to see. Um, I, I certainly think our agile use cases are more um, of what we think the traditional use case would be in that intense collaboration where people are working on a product and they um, you know, are sharing design ideas or troubleshooting code. Um, and so those are the types of things we're seeing in our workforce now that we've uh, really moved into this agile construct of doing work. Yeah. Great. And how much does geographic distribution, global distribution affect um, the way that people are working? Yeah, I think, I think it um, is impacting. You know, when your team is all together in one place and they can see each other, um, you develop this sense of community with your, with your working team. Um, when you add the um, element of geographical disbursement to it, it makes sometimes that team interaction, um, you have to exert more energy to develop that team, that sense of team. Um, and so I, I definitely see that uh, having the capabilities where people can interact more real time and where it's not formal helps um, sort of get past that barrier of geographic disbursement and allows the team to create that dynamic that would be natural to them if they were all co-located co in the same place. Um, so I think it's definitely something, as we see the teams become more geographically dispersed, the need for rich capabilities to support collaboration is even more um, paramount to the success of the teams. And what do you mean by rich capabilities? Yeah, so like you want to see people's facial expressions. You want to hear the inflection in their voice. You want to, um, you know, be able to collaborate with them in a way that you were right there with them. And I think that the richness of that interaction is something really important to a team's dynamic and success. Um, and so the. The, the tools that we use have to be so seamless and intuitive to people that they don't have to get over a technology barrier to be able to use them and have that experience. They can just intuitively use the tools and, and really work in a team the way they would if they were all sitting together. Great. Okay. Uh, so my last question uh, is really looking toward the future. Sure. Um, so what is next? What big changes uh, do you anticipate in... Um, work over the next five to ten years? I think harnessing the, um, the analytics, so the data that we can see on how people are using these tools, um, really being better at predicting, anticipating what they're going to need. Um, I say the conversational um, interaction that you can have um, with technology, these are things that we're certainly seeing in our um, personal lives, um, and we want to figure out the way in which to use those in the work environment so that um, Again, your, your work environment sort of just is alive with you, and it, it can predict that I always go to have coffee at this time or have lunch in this place. Hey, Jennifer, that place is really busy right now. You might want to go to a different location. And so har we've got all these, these uh, various technologies in place, but harnessing the data behind them mm -hmm. to really um, understand how people are using not only their physical workspace, but the tools that we've given them, and, and look for ways to improve their day-to-day their -day experience. We want them to come in and not have technology hurdles with the tools they're using. We want them to come in and be their best and be productive and innovative. I think um, looking for ways to harness that analytics and then um, where there are places where we can use the conversational um, technology would be really helpful to the workforce. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so any other examples on what harnessing the analytics might look like? Yeah, I think, you know, when um, we've already started with this a little bit. I mentioned the um, parking deck example. Um, but I think there are you know, a lot of opportunities where um, we have information now about how people are interacting in their workplace. And we can create an experience not unlike the Disney experience for our employees. So when they come to work, we know um, where they typically um, will go from parking. We can anticipate that the parking garage is full. Um, we can anticipate uh, where they are 
are going to um, do things throughout their day. So if it's, I mentioned the eating example, but if we know that the, the cafes are really busy, we might suggest a different one to go to. So harnessing the analytics and understanding what you're doing throughout the course of your workday and then being able to almost anticipate what you'll need on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. is where I think we're really going with this. And so it's really maturing how we've implemented the tools and get the data from them in a way that now we can predict how you might need to interact with your workspace and make it come, like I said, come alive around you to be more of a um, really great experience as an employee. So I want to circle back to what you were talking about earlier in terms of employees' expectations sure. and, and what's coming from um, their experience with technologies outside. How, how does the use of data analytics sort of um, blend those experiences of technology technology outside and inside the organization. Yeah, I think, I think understanding um, you know, what, what things, what capabilities or tools people are using in their personal lives, it, having a better understanding of that actually helps us prepare for what they're going to expect when they come into their work, in the work day. Mm -hmm. um, and so really understanding uh, the, the tools that people are finding most effective in their personal lives, they're going to need something like that when they come to work. And so if we understand how they're using those tools and how those tools are adding value to their personal lives, it actually helps us meet their expectations better when they come into the workforce because then we know, okay, well, people are really um, really finding value in collaboration and, and file collaboration or document sharing because they're sharing pictures with their families. So they're going to want to do something like that when they come to work, um, be it you know, sharing documents with coworkers. So I think understanding what is going going on um, in the consumer world of technology use readily applies to how we do things in the enterprise because then we can understand and anticipate what the expectations will be. And I think it prevents us from having expectation misses for people when they come to work. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was so sure. interesting and gave thank us you. a lot to think about. Uh, so let's thank Jennifer.